Welcome to the, the making of the Atom demo. Uh, we'll start by talking a little bit about uh, graphics, then we'll go to animation and uh, visual effects. Uh, so my name is Robert. I was the, the graphics programmer on this production. And uh, this won't be a comprehensive how to render your Atom demo, because we don't really have time for that. Uh, so I just picked uh, a couple of interesting bits that allow me to show you some pretty pictures. and. We'll talk about those. So we'll go through area lights, tube lights, uh, volumetric fog, and, uh, and the translucency effect for the mask. Um, so um, area lights. We knew that uh, we'll have a shiny robot that's going to be composed of uh, materials like metal, shiny plastics, the environment will be shiny, basically everything will be shiny, it will be mostly led by the specular reflections from the light. So with that setting, you can't really do it with point lights anymore, right? Because it's really obvious, like in the, the size of the specular is, is not going to be right, the, the material response won't be like in real life, because in real life you don't really have point lights, they don't exist, they always have size. And uh, there's also things like, you know, you want to you want to create a certain mood in the scene. So it wouldn't be really possible to light the entire, like the, 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 back, of, the back of Adam and kind of show that this is really like a big light behind them if you were using spotlights. We really needed air lights for this. Uh, so, uh, so thankfully, uh, during the production, our colleagues from Unity Labs, uh, they finished the research about uh, about doing just that, about rectangular or actually polygonal uh, area lights. And uh, yeah, they collaborated on this with, uh, with two other researchers from outside of Unity. Um, and, and we ended up just, uh, just implementing uh, their solution and adding some uh, PCs, PCSS shadows on top of that. So, um, so that was the result after just uh, one night of hacking. It was, it's, a, it's actually a, a pretty amazing paper. Uh, it gives uh, the, the area lights are performing really well. They can work with almost any BRDF, and certainly with the BRDF we have in the standard shader, so the GDX and Disney Diffuse. Um, and, and also, it's actually like we were using the third to, to render Adam. So it's super easy to add the, the lights uh, to the pipeline. Some more shots. This is actually the shot that will go uh, into the SIGGRAPH presentation, because that was that the, the paper was, uh, was being prepared for that. So the nice thing is that it was really easy to add them to the engine, because basically uh, the area light is just a, is just a component with, with a bunch of settings. Uh, when it wakes up, it adds itself to any cameras that want to render it as a command buffer that's run after lighting. And the command buffer just sets up some uh, shader uniforms and renders the, um, you know, the, the proxy shape for the light. And the proxy shape is, uh, is run with the shader that samples the, the G buffer, does the uh, linear cosine transform, the, you know, the, the area light calculations, and outputs whatever its, its output. It just plots it out the, to the frame buffer that at this point already contains uh, the lit scene before anything else happens, so it just adds light on top of that. Um, and the shadows, um, the shadows for area lights are really tricky. So, but we had to have something, right? So uh, we just settled for the simplest thing possible. So it's a setup pretty much like for a spotlight. So you have your you have your camera with the with the perspective projection. The near plane is aligned with the rectangle of the area light. Um, and then you can you have the adjustable angle and then the distance, so you render a shadow map like this, and then you and then you sample it with uh, with PCSS to get some some kind of softness. It's not the real softness that you should have with an area light, but um, yeah, but it is a, a soft shadow. Uh, so next up, tube lights. We wanted to have some other shapes for lights as well, and maybe uh, you know some some omnidirectional lights, lights that can be used for fill. 
Uh, and there's this um, presentation by Brian Harris where he, where he explains how they used uh, the representative uh, point technique to, to kind of like fake your way into area lights. It's, it's, a, it's a very cheap approximation, so it doesn't, it's way lower quality than the, than the area lights, but it has some uses, and it's, um, and it's, an, it's, a, it's, a, it's a different light shape, so that's always nice. Um, so yeah, so we use them to you know to have like you know, highlights of of different shapes in the in the scene. Uh, we use them for as a, as a cheap fill light, but that still has some like area light quality to it. And because the um, the way the technique works is that you choose the just one point on the surface of the light, and for for a given point on the surface that you want to shade. And you pretend as if the, this is this is your point light, but the thing is that at, dif at different uh, surface points that you want to shade, you choose different points on the light. So the effect is that you get some. It looks like an area light, right? But when you're actually um, running your lighting calculations, when you're actually evaluating the BRDF, you're pretending that it's just a single point. So it's very easy to plug it into any BRDF because, well, you're still shading kind of one. One point using well uh, as if it was lit from from one point. So that's why it was pretty easy to add it to to the fog as a fog light, and uh, to also to make the uh, the mask translucent. So to to light the mask with that, even though they were like pretty complex uh, uh, BRDFs. We we didn't really want to do shadows for an omnidirectional light because that's always uh, pretty terrible if you have to render six times or if you have to render it twice, but with probability shadow maps, uh, which have the um, you know like the, the projection issues and light leaking, but we still wanted some kind of extra control. So with kind of okay, so if the light is on this side of of the light blocker, some wall, you don't want it on the other side. Or maybe you wanted to light the character, but not the wall behind them to have some artistic control. Um, so I just added uh, um, like the simplest thing possible. So there's, uh, you can, the, the artist can define two planes, which can be placed anywhere in the scene. And they're kind of directed. So you know that the light, the light will be only on one side of, the, of that plane, and the other is shadow, the other is cut off. So here in the image, you have like one plane on one side, the other on the other side. And they also have adjustable feather. So one plane is doing the sharp cutoff, and the other is doing the, uh, the, kind of the, the smooth uh, cutoff. And you see that the same, the same shadow plane is also affecting the, the fog. And um, so they, they don't make the, the materials look as nice, but you see they have some. Uh, they have some applications. They can look pretty nice sometimes. Uh, so next up is fog, and this is actually the cool bit. So um, we wanted to do something like this, basically, right? So you have some some medium in the air that's scattering uh, that's scattering the light, and and the light is shadowed in it, and you see like the volumetric shadows and so on. Um, to first of all, to give the uh, the scene like more uh, more weight, more volume, but also maybe to to make it less synthetic, to show that Adam is not just uh, just a mechanical body, right? To have something, some kind of uh, moisture uh, in the air. And there are plenty of opportunities for those like epic volumetric shadows. So there was this um, this solution. Uh, that uh, Bartek Wroński came up with for Assassin's Creed Black Flag. He called it the volumetric fog. And, uh, and it handled um, everything that we needed, basically. So we needed, we wanted, you know, heterogeneous media. So basically, like you see, like you see even here, right? There's, there's the, the mist is kind of like twisting in the air. You see it has different densities. It adds some interesting variation to the, it's, it's not just like a uniform beam, right? And then, and then we had all the different kinds of uh, lights in the scene. Some of them would be shadowed. And we needed something that would support that. So the way that works is that um, you, you divide your um, 
camera frustum into voxels, so basically like voxels aligned with the frustum, so you slice it like this and horizontally and vertically. Uh, for every, you run a computer shader for every voxel, and you evaluate your medium density function. And the medium density function can be anything, right? It can be a, a 3D scalar function, like uh, animated noise in our case. can be a primitive, so we had uh, those like ellipsoids with just like a smooth fall off to, hey, we want some more fog density in this, in this corner, right? Or uh, you can even have particle effects inje injecting density into, into the thing, right? Then you, um, then you inscatter your shadow light. So again, for every voxel you see, is this voxel in light? If so, then inscatter light. And do it in, a, you know, because this, is, this medium is, uh, that's big particles, that's mist. So we have the me scattering. Me scattering is very anisotropic. But you can still do it with, uh, with this uh, technique, right? Because you know your light direction, you know the distance to the camera. So, um, so, so, so we did some simple uh, anisotropic scattering approximation. Um, and then finally, you, uh, you walk through the volume in slices away from the camera, and you accumulate the, the, the in-scattered light. And at the same time, you accumulate extinction. And the in-scattered light, the, the color of it goes into the RGB of your, of your volume texture. And the extinction, the accumulated extinction, that's kind of you know how much your scene will be darkened by just going through the, uh, through the volume of the, of, the, of the medium that goes into alpha. And once, that, once you have that prepared, uh, you apply it to the scene simply by uh, getting the, the screen position of the, of the pixel, its depth. That allows you to sample the, the volume at the right point, and then you just multiply the color of the pixel by the extinction. So you know you need to darken it. And then you add the um, inscatter light on top. And the amazing thing is that you actually, since you have correct um, inscatter information throughout the whole volume, it doesn't only work at the end of the scene for the opaque stuff. You can actually light uh, any transparent geometry that's in between, no matter how many layers is that. And you light it just by you know one texture sample, and then a multiply add. And this is how it looks like with, um, with a direction light that's shadowed. Uh, there's some animated fog and, and yeah, a bunch of objects casting a uh, volumetric shadow. And this one was with, this, with the tube light. And again, it was pretty easy to make it work because, because of the, uh, the representative point approximation. And you can see that this fog also has some variation in the, uh, in the density of the, of the medium. So next up, shadows. So um, this is, by the way, an area light, right? Because we used area lights as our key light. So the one behind Adam, that was, that was an area light. And of course, it needed to be shadowed because we had all the cables and the rig the Adam was hanging from that needed to cast shadows. Um, so they have to be super soft because, I mean, you see that those shadows were super soft, right? But also because uh, otherwise we can't really, we couldn't really render it. And you'll see in a moment why. So we have to pre-filter them in some way. And the original paper suggests exponential shadow maps, but they actually didn't work for us at all. Because exponential shadow maps, they, um, they, they approximate the shadow test by an exponential function. So it's softer nearer the, the shadow caster and gets harsher away from it. So you don't have a good control over softness. It also has a lot of light leaking. So when we had, it works for buildings, right? But we had Adam with the area light behind him. And, and then you, know, you would have lit fog right in, like, in front of his chest because this, this much light was leaking. So it turns out that variance shadow maps are a much better fit for us because they, they stay equally soft uh, throughout the entire le length of the shadow. And, you, um, and they have artifacts. They have a different kind of artifacts. So they can introduce like, new kind of uh, light leaking. Uh, when there's a big uh, distance between the shadow casters, but um, you can't really see it when it's when it's when it's something when it's effect like this. 
So this is what happens when you don't do any pre-filtering. So this is, uh, I think, with uh, 1K shadow map. And it's just, you know, a voxel either sees dark or light. So the change in the, uh, the signal frequency is basically very high, right? You have those rapid changes, but our voxels are pretty big. So you're sampling below the Nyquist frequency of that single signal to kind of like capture it properly. So what you're actually, actually seeing is aliasing. Um, and then if you, uh, so then we, we capture like, I think this was captured at 1K or 512, the, the shadow map. And then downsampled and blurred, uh, you know, after converting to uh, variant shadow maps. And this way you get, not only you get something soft, so closer to the, uh, to the natural effects, but also suddenly because your signal is much smoother, so, you know, the, the, the change between the light and the dark is much smoother, with the same sampling rate, you're suddenly above the Nyquist frequency and you don't get any aliasing anymore. So, yeah. Some pretty soft and, and thick volume shadows. Uh, finally, we wanted to add some, some more high frequency variation to it, some more like, you know, uh, detailed movement. And Zdravko did it by uh, doing a, a part of particle effect that's just a flip book that's flitting, flipping by uh, through a pre-animated texture. But we wanted to light it, right? We have a bunch of lights with different colors, with different intensities, the fog is different. Uh, different volume, and it turns out that if you kind of uh, apply the fog incorrectly, so you just multiply the inscattered color with the rest, you can get you can get just that. So you can get lit particles basically for free, and they're lit by they're lit and shadowed by all the lights you have in the scene. So yeah, a pretty moody heavy lighting. And finally, we had the, the mask. So, so we have a lot of close-ups in, uh, in the first part specifically. So we wanted the mask to be something more interesting to look at. So the idea was to make it, make it semi-transparent and then put some interesting shapes behind it, right? So there's the whole like, frame that supports the mask and the eyes with the, with the you know, animated eyelids and everything. So this, is, uh, this effect is a combination of a few effects, actually. Uh, it's, um, uh, I start with uh, rendering the mask and sampling the depth buffer, and then running a function that compresses the depth into, into a more interesting uh, range with an exponential function so that it goes from uh, zero, black, to white. And zero just means that we'll, we won't be blurring at all, and white means we'll be doing the full kind of depth of field style blur, right? So when we, when we apply the blur, we see that the, the frame just behind the mask is fully sharp, but then it kind of gradually blurs out, and the background is, is blurred as well. Next up, uh, this is the, the bug faces, so the, the, the normals of the bug faces, and combined with the normals of the front faces, we can kind of pretend that the mask is refracting the light a little bit, so you know, like bend light more if the uh, if the normal as we're hitting the surface in the front and the back, as the normals point away from that direction more, then we kind of just offset it more, uh, and it makes it it gives the mask a bit more thickness this way. Uh, finally, we wanted some contribution from the analytical light, so that was the tube light in this case, and there was this talk in 2011. Uh, about how you can bake AO with inverted normals and then use um, uh, a simple function to basically ap approximate how the light would in scatter in such a thick medium, but in a very simple and cheap way. Uh, and this is, this is that contribution. So you see it gets where the mask is thicker, it gets darker, the le less, less of the light passes through and it's brighter when it's thin. And finally, this is the, just the regular surface lighting from the standard shader. And all the effects combined give this. So yeah, so references. And that's it, thanks. Hello, I'm Krystyn Jarneczewski. I'm the hands-on animation director for Adam. 
and I will be talking to you about the things I did myself uh, for this demo. Uh, <clears throat> these will be previews. Adam's rig, manage, uh, I managed the mock-up sessions. I also did the anim some of the animations uh, for the interior scenes, and uh, so, uh, most of the animations for the interior scenes and some of the exteriors. I designed the crowd system and assembled the demo in the uh, sequencer and also managed the external contractors. For, for the, firstly, I want to talk about the previous. For the previous, we wanted uh, to keep it uh, as flexible as possible and iterate uh, throughout the whole production. So we started right away without any uh, concrete uh, storyboard or anything. We just uh, started with the previous and a general idea, and we went from there. These are examples of how Adam looked throughout the whole demo, and at every stage we wanted, uh, even without the model, just the rough idea, we wanted to be able to see him and uh, iterate on, on different aspects like cameras, perform, performance, etc. This, this is an example of the first iteration, which involved uh, making some tests with uh, an actor using a, a very affordable markerless mock-up solution. Uh, we assembled it in Motion Builder, and we went right at the most important, important parts for the demo for us. But uh, <clears throat> we wanted to be able also to uh, iterate on the tools we'll need for the, uh, for the assembly at, at the later stages, so we, write, uh, we went right into Unity and assembled it there using the director tool at the stage it was then. The collaboration with the director team was very effective because we were able to influence the tools they produced and uh, they would uh, in return get a very <coughs> uh, nice feedback which uh, gave them uh, the ability to see how the director will be used in a real time pro in a real world situation. This is an example of, of a scene uh, from the first test inside of Unity, which were like two months in, in after we started. Uh, that's another example of Adam, Adam's previous in his, one of his many forms, uh, which is actually an example from Motion Builder, but this was also put right away into Unity to iterate on cameras, tools, etc. The other thing I want to talk about is Adam Zrick. So we, we wanted him to feel as realistic as possible, and uh, so for, for, for that we needed him to be f actually mechanically functional. A lot of his uh, parts were pr uh, using procedural animation. As you see here, his uh, scapulas, clavicles, his neck bones, are procedurally driven and baked into the, the final animation and imported into Unity. Another big part of Adam was his eyes. We wanted him to look as much hum human as possible without having, having an actual eyes. So we imitated the eye anatomy with, uh, with Mechanical, little mechanical parts resembling like uh, photo cameras, blends, and uh, for example, the the little segments that compose his eyelids are reacting to the cornea, bulging them, and uh, the pupils dilate, and, and things like that. You, you, we want him, we wanted Adam to look as as human as possible, because we didn't want him to be perceived as a robot or anything. We, want him to, we wanted him to seem conscious. After the, the Adam's, uh, Max's uh, Adam Rick, we imported it into Motion Builder, when, where, where he uh, had a human eye care rig, and most of the animation was done in Motion Builder, actually. 
uh, only the parts that uh, needed polishing were in, inside of Max were his eyes and his fingers. We wanted to start with an actor right away, so we, we will be able to rehearse with the actor uh, more, give him feedback and, on what we wanted, and on the other hand, uh, the actor could get into the ro role better and understand what we wanted f from him. Because we wanted to start as early as possible, we used a markerless mock-up solution, which didn't provide very high quality, but we could iterate very fast with it. So we made, let's say, four or five runs at, and shooting the whole movie, in all of its entirety, and then iterated and uh, changed his performance. He also gave us back feedback, and uh, that's how we managed to pull off the final performance. And also, with all of these preparations and iterations, we were, when we went to the final mock-up uh, session with the Vicon system, we were feeling very uh, confident and we, wanted, we knew exactly what to do. So we managed to shoot extremely large quantities of material in just one and a half days. In these uh, one and a half days, we shot all of Adam's mm, animations, uh, virtu the virtual cameras, the guards, uh, the characters on the stilts, and practically everything. We had more than one, uh, more than these two shootings. They show so these, all these preparation led to the fact that we were able to afford going back into the volume and reshooting later, uh, which was the initial idea, uh, iterating and redoing the stuff we didn't like until it's as close to perfect as possible. Another thing we wanted to do properly and not fake was the, character on, the characters on the stilts. We called them Sebastian and the Lieutenant. We didn't want to ditch corners there, so we went, went and fo we were uh, fortunate enough to find a stunt, stuntman who knew how to handle stilts. And uh, <clears throat> he also performed our acrobatics, ac acrobatics where the bots get shot and uh, played some of the guards. As for animation, I won't bore you with the technicalities of uh, retargeting, um, cleaning, etc. But most people were asking me about the, how did I do the ice, and uh, that's why I'll just briefly mention them here. Well, as I mentioned earlier, the rig is, was helping a lot. I made it so every part was moving. It, it had like more than 100 moving parts only in the eyes. Uh, for the eyes, I took a, a helmet cam with a GoPro, and I pointed it at the actor, and I captured for reference uh, his eyes, and then analyzed them. And this, this uh, animation is not actually used inside, but it was mostly for reference, but I, I, I was analyzing it for days and uh, was uh, judging how fast his pupils dilated, how fast he blinked, uh, how, how the whole performance stitched together with his, with, with his body movement and his eye, eye, eye movement. For example, he, here he's turning his head and uh, you could see clearly that his, how his eyes follow uh, the movement of the environment, like they are not like, they are very stuttery and uh, they are moving in quick successions and while trying to follow just single objects. I want to talk to you more about the crowd system also. Uh, for the crowd system, we wanted it to be uh, embedded in Unity. We didn't want to import anything. Like there are a lot of great crowd solutions out there but we needed for it to work inside of Unity. We needed it for it to be 100% deterministic. So whenever we do a simulation and we, we change something and we repeat the simulation, we get the same result only with the changes we made applied. 
Also, we needed, it, we needed our crowd to work with the new sequencing tool. Uh, <clears throat> we needed it to be able to update on every frame, scrub back and forth, which is actually not that easy because uh, animations usually stream uh, from front to back. So for the crowd system, I, I decided that it will be best if you used uh, industry, industry standard approach and use vector fields, which are basically vectors in a grid, which would uh, orient the crowd agents under the, in, in the, under the field. Uh, with some altering tools, we made some altering tools to alter the field's direction. You could see uh, the difference in the arrow, little arrows, which show the vector field. And uh, there were, we used splines. And those splines were able to either direct the vector field towards the uh, along the spline, or, or towards the spri spline, or, or away from the spline. For the agents themselves, we used a very rudimentary uh, state machine, which, uh, which is like made with an animator inside of Unity. It had three walks. Uh, and some transitions to the duck and stand-up animations, stopping animations, idle, and uh, etc. Also, we wanted a lot of control with the crowd system. Like, we, we needed to put some crowd members exactly when we, where we wanted them in a shot. So, uh, we, we made a very nice tool to, for altering the, the age, every single agent's behavior. You could pick any one of them, see his starting point. As seen here, you can see his path. And you, can, you could also uh, randomize his uh, choice of animations and states. You could also add uh, uh, timed triggers, so he changes state at uh, some point later during the simulation. Another thing I want to talk about is the sequencing tool, where most of the uh, assembly of the whole thing happened later. So you already saw a, uh, a talk about it, and I'll just briefly tell you about which parts were m most uh, valuable to us. Like, it felt a lot, of li a, a lot like uh, the standard uh, editing tools for animations like Motion Builder, and that was the whole idea. And that why it was so comfortable to work, work with it. And we tried to influence the tool set, we, we, the tool set of the sequencer, so we get the comfortable and familiar ex user experience we, we are used to. So practically all the uh, characters are using uh, standard animations clips. Every animation is uh, exported in its root in the zero point. And we were able for every clip to like the standard, we do the standard uh, thing like uh, changing the position in world space, rotating, aligning to other animations. You, we could you could also blend uh, two animations together if you if because of, at some points we lacked the length of the mockup. It wasn't enough, so we stitched many like it's, it's the usual process. Uh, for cameras, it was very, very helpful because we did capture most of the, vir most of the cameras with the virtual camera in the volume, but uh, for some, we decided that we need a different approach because we, we were not quite sure what, what they should be. So we made some generic cameras, like standing still, rotating, walking forward, and we assembled some of those inside of Unity, inside, with the, inside of the director uh, in the sequencer, only by uh, blending and positioning them wherever we, we wanted. Another very useful tool we had in the sequencer was uh, the so-called custom playable tracks, which are basically play playable scripts. These were used for, to drive the crowd animation and uh, we could we we, hold, we had uh, like a lot of 
properties exposed there. We could rebake. You could save a snapshot of any state of the of the crowd, and you could just save it and then load it in another scene. So it was very comfortable to work with. Another thing we used the director was. Uh, Another thing we used the playable scripts were was the screen manager, which was a script that practically could with this script you could practically change anything in your scene for per shot. So you could add lights, change lights, uh, move uh, things around, <clears throat> and change camera properties and whatever you wanted. It's it was a playable script per camera. Another very useful thing of the sequencer is that you don't need to go out of it to animate. You could just re uh, push record and uh, move things around, and they'll get keyed. And you could alter the curves, etc. This way, we made our depth of field, for example, some fades, and whatever it was, whatever we animated inside of Unity. Uh, thank you. That's what was for. That's it for me. Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Zdravko Povov, and I work as a CG artist. I've been doing uh, visual effects uh, in the past few years, and I was uh, lucky enough to be on the team that uh, made this demo. My job was to create uh, some particle systems and dynamic simulations, among a few other things. And in terms of uh, particle systems, uh, there is really nothing extraordinary, at, uh, nothing that doesn't come out of the box when you install Unity. It's a shuriken particle system. It's uh, quite capable system, very robust, and uh, we didn't need to modify it at, at all. We did have uh, some nice uh, rendering uh, techniques that uh, Robert was uh, telling you about in the beginning of this presentation with uh, the volume fog and the lighting, uh, and you can see on... Well, it's a little bit dark, uh, but uh, you're supposed to, to see um, how they react with the light. And um, we used a uh, few uh, texture sheets. Uh, for example, this one. Uh, it uses a normal map and renders in off-screen buffer and applies on the puddles to create the tiny ripples. Uh, the textures are rendered from a uh, simulation like uh, this one. I doubt that this particular texture come out of this simulation, but uh, I will just, just put them together just to illustrate the idea. Uh, this one is simulated with uh, Phoenix FD. It's a fluid simulation software by uh, Chaos Group. And uh, also I used it to create um, the um, texture sheet for that I used for the smoke uh, inside uh, Adam's chamber. And uh, this one I put in there because I was asked how we did the effect of the screen switching off. Uh, it's an After Effects project that I put uh, together. Uh, I render out two textures. The left one is for Adam. It uses all the frames. It's in bigger resolution and more frames, and uh, the other one is uh, using uh, every single row is a different version, of course, a smaller uh, resolution, and it was used for the bots in the background. And in terms of dynamic simulations, there are quite a few things going on. Uh, we had the cables that uh, Adam, Adam is uh, attached to to his machine and the uh, tearing of the sleeve, the convict that uh, gets shot and fractured, some bullet impacts, and cloth simulations for the guards and for um, our other two characters. And uh, the most important thing about those simulations that has to be said is that they're all 
pre-calculated and pre-baked. There are no real-time calculations whatsoever in this project. And I know that some might say, well, if it's not real-time, then we don't really care about it. But uh, really, there are all kind of um, technical considerations, of course. CPUs, uh, memory status, what's your status in the current shot. But also, uh, you have to ask uh, your, yourself a question. Do I really need different outcome every single time? And of course, you do if you have some player interaction and uh, uh, you expect it to unfold differently. You probably have to do it in real time. But if you have a cinematic movie, for example, like we did, or even some scripted cinematic event during uh, gameplay. Let's say you're driving a jeep over a bridge and the bridge collapses because it's built by pirates. It could happen. Uh, well, it's probably better if you uh, make sure that uh, you bake this simulation and it unfolds the same time every time. And basically, you're treating it as animation. You just trigger it at some point. And the good thing about this method is that you can make those calculations wherever you like. You can use Max. You can use Maya. You can use Houdini if you want. As long as you can output some data that you can put in inside Unity, it's, it's OK. And um, that, uh, because our goal in this project was visual quality. So we, we uh, decided to use offline uh, calculations. And uh, the first shot I was briefed on was the tearing of the sleeve. And uh, I'm a 3 studio Max user. I don't know if I mentioned that. I did a little bit of research. I looked at um, other cloth systems. I looked at Maya's and cloth, but uh, this is one of my very, very first tests that I did with um, 3D Studio Max. And uh, I was quite happy with the result. So I decided that uh, 3D Studio Max cloth modifier is uh, capable enough to, put, uh, to pull off this, uh, this shot. Uh, so that's the setup inside uh, 3D Studio Max. Uh, we had one thing. We didn't want the actual grabbing to happen on screen, because it's really a hard thing to do. And the other uh, thing uh, that, was, uh, that made this shot a little bit trickier was the close proximity of the clot to the underlying geometry, uh, because it's supposed to be tightly wrapped uh, like a packaging uh, thing. And this would honestly give hard time to almost any simulation engine. So what we did is to use a skin wrap modifier and uh, treat it as a skin uh, mesh through half of the simulation. And then only the parts that were peeled off were gradually included in the simulation. So that uh, is what made uh, this, uh, this shot possible. And um, I said that you have to export some data. I used the Alembic uh, importer uh, that's produced by Unity Japan. It's um, available on GitHub. And that is the, uh, the simulation inside Unity. It's hooked up to a sequencer, and it's uh, playing back and forth in uh, real time. You can see the density of the mesh. Yeah, probably that's interesting. And we moved on to the other shots. And uh, this one is uh, an option to build a chain of bones connected with uh, joints and use them as uh, rigid bodies. Uh, and then skin a uh, tube or cylinder on it. and uh, you have uh, a rope or a cable, basically. So I was uh, thinking about 
uh, doing this. I even made some tests. This one is a little bit slow in the beginning, but uh, just bear with it for a second. So this method gives pretty pretty good results. It uh, it could have work, worked, but um, we came across something, uh, some piece of software called Caronte Effects. It's developed by uh, Next Limit, the same guy that developed PrioFlow. And uh, I didn't know anything about it. I was given the, the installer and asked to take a look. Uh, it sounded familiar. I didn't know what it is. But then I realized it's a um, piece of, um, it's a multi-physics um, simulation software that has been part of 304 for quite some time. And if you have some sequence where a giant tsunami is going through the streets of a town and uh, sweeping all the cars, and they start bumping uh, to each other and piling up, uh, that's all current effects. And as I'm sure you know, real flow is used in some major Hollywood productions. And suddenly, it turns out we have this piece of software working inside Unity. So uh, no dealing with imports, exports, whatsoever. And that was, I mean, how convenient is that? And uh, in fact, so convenient that I was willing to ditch the software that I'm quite comfortable with and start learning the, a new one. And. Uh, the good news was that it's not that hard to learn, actually. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, and this, this shot looks, <laughs> I can say, a lot better with uh, those pretty, pretty accurate face-to-face uh, -face collisions that otherwise wouldn't be possible with um, the skinned uh, option. Uh, it did produce, however, quite large caches uh, in terms of hundreds of megabytes. I managed to go over a gigabyte at uh, one point. So I started um, lowering the complexity. I ditched some ropes. But uh, then we uh, said uh, we share our, our problem with the current team. And they said, OK, we can um, do uh, the following. We can still skin them and record only the position of the, of the bones. Uh, but you will still have uh, the accurate face-to-face -face collisions during simulation. And then when you bake it, you can choose whether you will want the bones or not. And it's just a, a checkbox. So this was a really great uh, time saver. Uh, so we did. Uh, the fracturing of the, the bot. The fracturing of the actual geometry was uh, done again with uh, Caronte. It has pretty sweet fracturing uh, options. And um, that's the guards. The white part is uh, motion captured. It's animation. And then the orange uh, parts are uh, simulated and uh, baked. It even has wind. This is actually an old um, version that doesn't have that strong wind. But we resim resimulated it. And uh, in, the, uh, in the final movie, it's uh, just stronger wind swaying uh, their skirts. And uh, this one is more complex. It's uh, one of the, um, the characters, again, put together with um, Caronte. Uh, the white part is optimized just so you don't uh, calculate unnecessary things. I mean, for example, you, you never, uh, because he's holding his hand like this, holding a gun or something, it never interacts with uh, the rest of the the simulation, so it was pointless having it there. And this one was uh, probably the, the most complex one. I 
would have put some colors if I know that it's that dark, but okay, I hope you can see it. It's uh, done on two layers, the, the back with all the straps, and uh, there are around 30 leather straps on his back. And it all hangs over a cloth cape, and then it's all put over a soft body mantle of some kind with all the hoses underneath and everything. And uh, also the, the bracelets. And um, the other layer of the simulation is the skirt with the knife, all the belts, and um, it's, uh, there's some sort of tablet uh, right there. And this one, I hope, is a little bit brighter. Uh, the two of them put together. This is some early shot inside Unity. So you can see the, the interaction of the soft bodies that are the, the cables on her head and uh, all the sweet little movements that are quite, actually quite hard to produce if they were hand animated. This piece that it's over here. I excluded it for, from the proxy. Then I realized it should be there, and I resimulated. Re so in the final version, it's, uh, it's collided in there. And um, that's uh, pretty much it.